Let's look at pleurocarps. We can start with pleurocarps that have leaves that are what is sometimes called falcate secund. Falcate is shaped like a sickle, and secund is swept to the side. And there's a number of mosses that fit this description that aren't super closely related. It must be a good example of convergent evolution. The most well-known one is called hypnum. And here's a log in Hocking County, which is covered with hypnum. It's probably hypnum imponens. And the way to recognize this moss is it's got a sort of feather growth form. It's once pinnate. There's a stem, a main stem, and there's branches. And notice that the leaves are swept to either side of the stems and the branches. And they're also kind of bent, looking like a sickle. This is sometimes called brocade moss or feather moss, and it's very, very abundant. Here it looks uh, through the micro. Here is what it looks like through the microscope, and you can see that there's not a much of a costa. It's a short double costa. A lot of junk in this slide, but um, the the cells in the corner, the leaves, they're kind of small. Along the stem are these sort of um, frilly-looking things called um, pseudoparaphilia. It helps have a microscope to identify these two species. Here's a moss called Pilesia delpha tenua rosteris, which is not as well known as it should be because it's really common in central Ohio. It kind of looks like a miniature hypnum. It's uh, got the same sort of aspect, a little bit less feathery, but the same look of the stems and branches, but it's smaller. It's about half the size. Here it is through the microscope, Pilesia delpha tenua rosteris, and again, um, these cells in the corner, they're like little bubbles, little balloons, the way they're inflated and hollow and expanded. Easy ID through the microscope, but not so easy in person. Here's one that grows on the ground in wet places, sometimes even lawns or maybe park lawns. It's called Calianaria ganella linvergii. It used to be considered to be in the genus Hypnum, and now not only is it in a different genus, but it's actually a different family. So this sort of... Uh, Physical similarity can be a confusing case of, of um, uh, convergent evolution, and people study these things in more detail, they find out their true relationships. These are the leaves of Cali organella of Limburgia, and its alar cells are kind of expanded too. And that's a way to tell it. Through the microscope, it's not so hard. Let's take a look at a few pleurocarps with lance-shaped leaves that have a mid-nerve, a costa. And some of these are especially common. Here's one called Anomadon rostratus. And rostrate means beaked. And the leaves of Anomadon rostratus are drawn to a long hair point that give it a sort of a spiky look. Also, the leaves are arranged around the branches, sort of puffy, um, like a cat's tail or a catkin or a caterpillar, <laughs> anything with cat in it, right? Um, that's called gelaceous. H here is... Um, Anomadon rostratus through the microscope, and you can see that hair point to the to the leaves. Um, this this moss, um, most of this is Anomadon rostratus, but another one growing with it is the closely related species called Anomadon attenuatus. They all have uh, minutely papillose, bumpy leaf cells, and that gives them, I think, a sort of a matte look, a sort of shiny, uh, not shiny, but a light color that's not shiny. It's sort of dull in the surface. Here's a moss that is shiny. It's called Campylium chrysophyllum. And the genus Campylium is sort of recognizable if you know where to, to look at the tips of the leaves. They're kind of folded into like a little channel or a little tube. So let's look at some pleurocarps with no costa that have leaves that are lance-shaped. There aren't very many in that category, but this one here, I decided to include one. It's called Campylium stellatum. And it's a moss that grows in beautiful fens, calcareous wetlands, that rich, nice rich ecosystems. It's kind of a, a indicator of a nice high quality wetland. Not a very common moss, but very distinctive. You can even almost see in this picture that the leaves don't have a costa. They're sort of translucent looking, very shiny, very tubular. Campylium. Pleurocarps with tongue-shaped leaves, lingulate leaves. It's an odd leaf shape, but when it's when it occurs, it really is helpful. The one that I'd like to draw your attention to is called Anomadon minor. Kind of misnamed because it's not very small. 
Um, this is a limestone bluff in um, it's um, on the west side of the Scioto River. It's on the north side of, no, I'm sorry, south side of Fissinger Road. It's this little park called Durensu Park, a little French name, I guess, Bonjour. And if you sort of poke around off the trails of that park, you can see this several uh, nice limestone outcrops that are covered with mosses and also a, a liverwort. It's a delightful place to go tromping when you don't have time to go far. And this is where Anamadan Minor grows in abundance. And it grows on rocks. It also grows on trees. And when it grows on trees, it grows kind of high up on a tree at head height or even higher, which is not especially common for large pleurocarps like this. And look how blunt those leaves are. It's a nice feature of this, of this Anamadan Minor. So pleurocarps with more or less broad leaves with mid nerves, there's a bunch of them. And well, we'll pick a few of the most common ones that you're likely to encounter out in the field. No particular order. Here's a log covered with one of Ohio's most common and abundant and beautiful mosses. It's called Thuidium delicatulum. Delicatulum means very delicate. And it's also called fern moss. Here it is growing next to a... a um, I thought it was a basswood leaf when I took the picture, but now I'm beginning to question it. Anyway, the moss is twice pinnate, kind of like a fern. There's a branch... And then there's, I mean, excuse me, a stem, and then there's branches, and then there's side branches off of that. It looks kind of ferny. It also has this light look, this light green sort of soft look that, again, is characteristic of mosses that have minute papillae on their cells. Another thing that Thuidium has is the stems are clothed with these filamentous, like leaf like structures that are called paraphilia. And it's believed that they help the moss wick up moisture absorb moisture from the environment. Lacking vascular tissue to suck up moss, it has something on the outside, kind of like a sponge. Here's a moss that's super, super, super common. I think it's tied with Thuidium for being the most common and abundant moss, maybe even more abundant. It commonly grows around the base of trees like an apron, so sometimes called tree apron moss. These common names like poodle moss, uh, they're sort of contrived. They're made up by the authors of a pretty nice field guide, but I think they kind of went a little too far when they started making up common names. I think they have their kids make up the common names. Some of them are kind of goofy. Anyway, um, sometimes it's called tree apron moss. And what distinguishes Anomadon attenuatus, it's aptly named because the branches, they sort of taper. You see how they go to a sort of a point? The leaves get progressively smaller and they look sort of like, oh, they've been sort of drawn to a tip, sharpened with a pencil sharpener. This is a very common moss. Here it is through the microscope. You can see the bumps on the leaves, cells, and a sort of irregular teeth at the tip. Here's a shady residential lawn in Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga County. It's in North Royalton. It's a friend of mine's lawn, two friends of mine, actually. And um, not, not, not as much grass here as some people might like. And it's shady and damp, and it's graced, I will say, not infested, by um, this moss. It's called tree moss, and it grows upright like a little tree. You might think, oh, it's an acrocarp. It's upright. No, it's definitely a branched and branched like a pleurocarp. It has horizontal stems, and then from up from them come some primary branches, and then off of that come secondary branches, and the sporophytes comes from the axils of those secondary branches. It's definitely a pleurocarp. It's just growing sort of upright, and like a tree, and it's called tree moss. It's very large for a moss, and it's very and very uh, distinctive. Here are the leaves of that Climacium. They have an interesting shape. They have little ears at the base. Climacium, like Thuidium, has paraphilia. Hair-like appendages, velvety clothing the stem to help the moss wick up moisture. Mosses are poikilohydric. That's a word that means, with respect to moisture, what, like what cold-blooded animals are with respect to temperature. They got to be however moist the environment is. When it's dry, they're dry. When it's wet, they're wet. And so they need to be able to um, adapt to different moisture conditions. And one of the ways is to be able to wick up moisture with paraphilia. Sometimes other adaptations are to be able to dry out really well. Here's climacium with sporophytes. You don't see that too often. Here's a moss that is sometimes called worm moss or spoon moss. 
The leaves are deeply concave. It's called Briarwandersonia illicebra. Uh, it's named after this person named Lewis Anderson, and the Briar part means moss, so I guess it's Anderson's moss. And it's pretty common in central Ohio. The leaves are deeply concave, and again, they're sort of distributed evenly around the stem and kind of puff out, looking sort of like a catkin. They're julacious. And, oh, by the way, that for scale, that we included a, a, a eastern red cedar cone. Yes, it's not a fruit. It's not a berry. It's a, it's a, it's a gymnosperm, so those, that's a, a, a modified cone. Here's a moss that a little aggravating because it's so hard to identify. It's called Brachythesium. It's a big genus that's hard to identify, even with the best equipment and the best books. Um, it tends to look sort of ragged because the leaves are minutely longitudinally folded. It's called plicate, and it gives it a sort of rough look. The name Brachythesium means broad capsule, but these capsules aren't particularly broad in this species, but some of them they are broad. Here's a close-up. It doesn't really show the plications, the folds in the leaf too well. Again, it's a difficult genus, but it's a very common moss and um, on logs and on the ground, sometimes even on rocks. Brachythesium. Well, let's take a look at some mosses without midnaves, mid midnerves, without costa. And there are a bunch of them, but not a lot, not very many of them are especially common so that they're likely to be seen by, by uh, a, one, on someone's first one or two times out looking at the mosses. But let's look at a, a couple that are especially common. This one's called glade moss. It's the genus Entodon. And it kind of looks a little bit like Briarandersonia. You can confuse them, but they're not a spoon shape. They're more flattened. And... They don't have a costa, and they um, don't have a little hair point the way that the Briarnesonia does. There's um, a, a round, a julacious one called Entodon seductrix. There's a flattened one, by the way, called Entodon clatterizans. They're a little hard to, for me to tell apart, but it's a shiny moss. It doesn't have those bumps on the cells, and it looks really shiny. Very pretty. Grows on on uh, logs, stumps. This is one that. Yeah, the author's kid called it Medusa moss. I kind of get it. Um, looks like an eyeball. This is a moss that um, structurally, uh, very unique, having um, sessile sporophytes, in other words, virtually no stalk. So the sporangium is surrounded by the uppermost leaves. And the leaves, you can't tell from this picture so much, but the leaf tips are um, free of chlorophyll. So they have a little... Um, Oh, I guess you can see it here and here. So they have a little white-tipped appearance. And Hedwigia is a moss that's characteristic of... Uh, here, you can see the white tips even better. And it's Papalos. Hedwigia is a moss that's, that grows on granitic boulders. It has a high affinity for boulders, and you're very likely to see it on boulders. Not likely to see it anywhere else except, funny thing, on roof shingles. Which, you know, they have like, a, like little stones that make up the outer surface of the shingles. So I kind of think the moss thinks it's on a boulder when it's on a roof. Again, that poikilohydric thing. These, this moss is capable of drying out. It looks sort of steely gray and kind of like, uh, kind of metallic almost. And it's per happy to persist that way for a long time. But when it gets moist, it puffs up and looks really lush and green and verdant. And uh, busily photosynthesizing and growing in those short times when it happens to be damp enough to do that. I like the way this looks. Switch back and forth. Poikilohydric mosses are. What about this group? Um, yeah, we're not only learning about pleurocarps. We have some mosses that are kind of kind of an odd, odd ones that um, stand apart from the others. These are acrocarps, but they're very distinctive. It's the family Polytricaceae. See, it ends in A-C-E-A-E, -E, so it's a family. Polytricum is a genus that means many hairs. And these are very robust acrocarps with upright sporophytes. And the, the, spor the sporangia are distinctive by their peristome. I'll show you in a second. The leaves are distinctive because they're mostly, um, they're much thicker than most moss leaves, which are just one pathetic little moss layer thick. So here's a picture of um, Polytricum, the genus Polytricum. And 
The leaves look almost almost evergreen, like almost succulent, almost like pine needles. And it turns out that they're very thick because they have ribbons of cells that run lengthwise. Um, picture coming soon. This is Politricum with the sporophytes and the gametophytes. So down below are some fairly large gametophytes. The sporophytes are upright. And the calyptra is composed of many hairs. Well, here's that picture again. That was kind of a mistake. Um, this is a cross-section of a leaf seen through the microscope of Politricum. This is actually Politricum communi. How can you tell? Because the terminal cells of the lamellae are indented. You actually have to do this in order to identify them, make cross-sections to the microscope. And um, But the feature here the, of note is these stacks of cells. And they go they, they, In Politricum, they go all across the top of the leaf, and there's stacks of these five or six cells. And these are ribbons of cells running lengthwise, and it makes the look, leaf look really thick. Plus, it's also many cells thick below that. These leaves are way different. Here's the eponymous hairs on the calyptra of Polytrichum. And um, here's the sporangia of Polytrichum. Un unlike most uh, peristomes, which consist of separate teeth, the tips of the teeth are fused together into like a disc. And the openings are little pores between what would have been separate teeth but aren't anymore. It's kind of like a salt shaker, if salt shakers had the pores around the rim and not scattered all the way across the lid. I wish they made a salt shaker like that so it would be more apt as a comparison. So those are distinctive sporangia. Uh, Here's, I don't, this is a picture of a bluff and along the Alum Creek and there's atricum in there somewhere. Here's what it looks like. Atricum has lamellae, but they're, 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 only, they're few in number. They're concentrated towards the middle of the leaves. So these little wavy lines in the middle of these leaves that I just defaced, here's, a, here's what they look like. See, they're lamellae. They're stacks of cells, ribbons of cells running lengthwise. They're concentrated toward the costa, and there aren't as many of them in politricum. That's one of the ways to recognize atricum. The other way, by the way, is that the calyptra has no hairs. So it's not a hair cat moss. It's a unhair cat moss, a bald cat moss. This is a cross-section of that atricum. And see the lamellae? They're stacks of cells, and they're concentrated on the costa. This is... What? I thought we said the Politricase he had large gametophytes. I don't see... I hardly see gametophytes. Maybe there's some here. This is a moss that... It's called Pogonatum pensylvanicum. And this all this green that's in the picture, this is my usual bad color balance because I'm colorblind. But this environment actually is green like this on the surface of this bare soil because this moss has a persistent protonema. Protonema. You might recall that a spore of a moss germinates to form an algal-like mass that's called the protonema, which is usually just a transitory stage from which the gametophores, the leafy parts, arise. But in a few mosses, including this one, the protonema is persistent and does the photosynthesis for most of the rest of the plant. So most of the, of the food-getting action here is done by this persistent protonema that's all on the ground and on the bare soil. This, the gametophyte is pretty small, but uh, belying, is that the word? It's uh, affinity toward the uh, other mosses in this family. Big sporangia with, with a hairy calyptra. Peat moss. Sphagnum is a whole order of mosses. It's separate from um, the other mosses we've learned. And they're very distinctive. They're mostly northern and they mostly occur in low nutrient situations, especially bogs, um, especially in the north, but sometimes along the Atlantic coast. Uh, there are some places in Ohio where they grow, and there's a lot of species in Ohio. They just aren't as as abundant um, as you as they are in other in other places. So they're especially fun to see. Structurally, what makes sphagnum different is just about everything. Um, this is an island a weird island in Cranberry Lake. It's in Licking County. And that lake was... It's in Buckeye Lake. I'm sorry, it's Cranberry Bog, and it's in a lake called Buckeye Lake. And the lake was created um, in the eh, 1800s, I think, when they were making canals to um, travel stuff. Travel stuff? To transport stuff in Ohio. 
And in order to create um, the right kind of water conditions for the canals, they flooded a um, creek that, in, that had a, a bog. And as the lake got bigger, the bog broke apart and floated in the lake. And it's been floating there ever since. And it's called Cranberry Bog. It's a state nature preserve that's actually the remnants of what was on the shore before this lake was produced. Uh, uh, and it is um, a fun place to go. And I went there uh, helping helping this plant and others removing invasive plants with a group called the Ohio Natural Area Preserves Association that does restoration and management of state nature preserves. This, this sphagnum moss is called Sphagnum rosoei. One of the features is the red color. Even I can tell it's red. So sphagnum through the microscope. It has s s leaves that ha are one cell thick, but the cells are of two different types. And the most interesting type is this one that's actually not alive. It's big cells that are hollow and empty and dead and have holes in them. And that, that makes the sphagnum moss be able to absorb a lot of water. It's famous for absorbing a lot of water in gardens. And um, what it does is it enables the sphagnum moss to kind of puff up and occupy a lot of space and be sort of um, dominant in an um, environment that's very low nutrients. So it doesn't have to construct a lot of biomass to make this bulk. And that's... Um, one type of cell. The other cells of sphagnum moss are these long, narrow cells that kind of form a network around or in between the, the, the what are called hyaline cells, green cells, and, and, and clear hyaline cells. And those green cells are the ones that do the physiology of the plant. And that's what sphagnum looks like through a microscope. It's kind of a radical genus. So here's a sphagnum moss that's growing in Delaware County. It's called sphagnum thimbriatum. And it's, this is showing the sporophytes. The sporophytes of sphagnum moss, they don't have a seta. Um, there's some peculiarities about them that are in sort of baseball details. But also, the, sporine, the sporophytes, um, they, kind of, they turn black. They look like little golf balls, and they have a lid that pops out when the spores are ripe and expels the spores kind of ballistically when it compresses. The sporophytes don't offer any clues for identification because they're the same uh, across all the sphagnums. So the identification is all leaf stuff and stem stuff, and it's kind of microscopic and technical, but it works. It's fun. Anyway, this is um, sphagnum fimbriatum, and it is uh, a great thing. So um, if, for, for identifying mosses, an approach which m might be effective would be to Identify a sample to the categories that we just saw, whether it's pleurocarp or acrocarp, whether it's a costa or it doesn't, whether the leaves are broad or narrow, whether it's a flat one or a sphagnum or a polytricum type thing. And within those categories, there are a number of mosses listed, some of which are featured in this presentation, but most of which are not. And go um, window shopping. Here's a, a website called Ohio Moss and Lichen Association. The URL is ohiomosslichen.org. So it's ohiomosslichen.org. And it's, um, this is the homepage, but there's a, there's a bryophytes tab. And if you drop down to that, there's a nice page that's got lots, about over 100 different Ohio mosses. They're alphabetical. And they have, um, each one of these pictures is uh, linked to a page for that particular moss. So if you look on the um, presentation, this presentation, and see um, a some types of mosses, like um, broadleaf mosses with, uh, with Acosta, um, you can run through, and if you think maybe it's Anacaptodon splachnoides, I can't remember if that's Acosta or not, um, Sorry, Anacaptodon. Did I just apologize to a moss? Um, you can look and look and see if that's your, if that's a match. If it's not, go on to the next one. This is a way to identify or provisionally identify your mosses. So, happy hunting for mosses.